the power of tribal clustering was clear too in the period of wild invention surrounding the software industry that accompanied the dawn of the personal computer. Silicon Valley has had a huge impact on digital technology. But as Dorothy Leonard and Walter Swap have noted, it's surprisingly small geographically. Viewing the valley from the flight approach to San Francisco International, they say, one is struck by how small the region is. As Venture Law Group's Craig Johnson notes, Silicon Valley is like any gas that's compressed. It gets hotter. Its tribes overlap socially and professionally based on work discipline. Software engineers, for example, organizational affiliation, like Hewlett Packard, or background, Stanford MBAs or South Asian immigrants. The most skillful players don't have to travel far to make deals, change jobs or find professional partners. John Durr of Kleiner Perkins is fond of saying that the valley is a place where you can change your job without changing your parking spot. Shared values also bind long-time Silicon Valley natives. The personal convictions of the valley's remarkable innovators who created not just a company but an industry still echo through the community. Bill Hewlett and David Packard influenced the older generation directly. Many of them were early employees. Through this old guard, collegiality and high standards for performance are being carried down to next-generation entrepreneurs. Other examples of tribes inspiring individuals to greater heights abound. The sports teams, the 1969 New York Knicks, the no-name defence of the undefeated 1972 Miami Dolphins, the 1991 Minnesota Twins, that performed as a collective that was more distinguished than any of the individuals. The Bauhaus movement in architecture in the early decades of the 20th century. In each case, the physical clustering of a tribe of creative individuals led to explosive innovation and growth. The Alchemy of Synergy The most dramatic example of the power of tribes is the work of actual creative teams. In Organising Genius, The Secrets of Creative Collaboration, Warren Bennis and Pat Ward-Biederman write of what they call great groups, collections of people with similar interests who create something much greater than any of them could create individually, who become more than the sum of the parts. A great group can be a goad, a check, a sounding board, they say, and a source of inspiration, support and even love. The combination of creative energies and the need to perform at the highest level to keep up with peers leads to an otherwise unattainable commitment to excellence. This is the alchemy of synergy. One of the best examples of this is the creation of Miles Davis's landmark album, Kind of Blue. While music lovers of every sort widely consider the recording a must-have, and legions of jazz fans, and classical and rock fans for that matter, know each note of the album by heart, None of the players on that album knew what they were going to play before they entered the studio. In the original liner notes to the album, pianist Bill Evans says that Miles conceived these settings only hours before the recording dates and arrived with sketches which indicated to the group what was to be played. Therefore, says Evans, you will hear something close to pure spontaneity in these performances. The group had never played these pieces prior to the recordings and I think without exception the first complete performance of each was a take. In fact, the songs that appear on the album are all the first full takes, with the exception of flamenco sketches, which was a second take. When trumpeter Miles Davis gathered Evans, along with tenor saxophonist John Coltrane, alto saxophonist Julian Cannonball Adderley, pianist Winton Kelly, bassist Paul Chambers and drummer Jimmy Cobb in the studio in 1959, he laid out the scales itself somewhat revolutionary, since jazz at the time was traditionally built around chord changes. And then he turned on the tape recorder. Hello, hello everybody. This is Patricia Curti, the founder of Gallery of Ideas. I hope you are enjoying this listening experience as much as I do. There is so much to learn from this brilliant mind that every minute we spend listening to their wisdom is absolutely priceless. Before I reset this room, I'd like to thank you all for being here today and remind you that um, to take advantage, to look around all the like-minded people who are in the room with you right now, connect with them, follow them, 
right? Follow the moderators, the ones with the green badge next to their names. All the moderators from Gallery of Ideas are incredible people who can make your journey here on Clubhouse much more enjoyable. They also open several rooms in their native languages. So make sure you tap on their photos, tap on my photo and hit follow. And don't forget to join Gallery of Ideas Club. Memberships here on Clubhouse are free of charge. And you can do that by tapping on the greenhouse at the top of your screen and clicking join. Our rooms are designed to be educational, inspirational and motivational. So make sure you share this room with your friends or share it here on Clubhouse so people can find you and follow you here. The button to share this room is at the bottom of your screen where you can also see the number of shares. Actually, let's do an exercise right now. Let's all share the room together. Let's do it right now and watch this number change. Come on, let's do it all together. Let's do it together now. Fabulous, fabulous. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing here on Clubhouse. Thank you for sharing on other platforms. As they say, sharing is caring, right? Next important thing is that I'd like to invite you all to join me on stage. Raise your hand if you'd like to join me on the stage or just wait for my invitation. I will send some invitations out to you in a moment. Just be mindful of your microphones when you enter the stage because by default, your microphones will be always open. So make sure when you join us on stage, just mute yourself, okay? I don't know if you know that, but listening from the stage on Clubhouse gives you a better audio experience. And for everyone who joins me on the stage, you will also get a shout out on my YouTube channel that is pinned at the top of the page. Make sure to subscribe to that and go to the community tab to see all the live comments and screenshots of this room. You will be able to interact with the live audience right here, right now. Isn't that marvelous? I love this. I love this. Right. So before we go back to the listening, to listen to the words of wisdom from these brilliant people, this brilliant mind. Uh, my final mention goes here about the other rooms, the other listening rooms that we have at Gallery of Ideas. We have FBN, Friday by Nico. It's a music room with live interaction from the incredible Nico, broadcasting directly from Rome and Barcelona. We also have Gallery of Ideas Radio Room, broadcasting from Barcelona on the Radio Garden platform with live studio recordings, incredible shows where you can also participate. You can all find the full calendar of events uh, on the clubs page right here on Clubhouse. Just tap on the clubs page and you will be able to see the calendar of events. Last but not least, if you wanted to meet us on the metaverse, you know, everybody's talking about the metaverse right now and we are full on. Let us know because let us know on the community tab on my YouTube channel because we are starting to host a few exclusive Gallery of Ideas events on the metaverse for our students and uh, GOI members. Just send us a message on the community tab and we'll uh, get in touch with you. But now let's go back to the purpose of this room, which is to improve our listening skills and enjoy this experience together. Each of these players was an active participant in the tribe moving jazz in new directions at that time, and they'd worked together in the past. What happened during the kind of blue sessions, though, was a perfect storm of affirmation, inspiration and synergy. These artists set out to break barriers. They had the skill to take their music in new directions, and they had a leader with a bold vision. Their improvisational work that day was the result of powerful creative forces merging and creating something outsized, the ultimate goal of synergy. When the tape started rolling, magic happened. Group improvisation is a further challenge, said Evans. Aside from the weighty technical problem of collective coherent thinking, there's the very human, even social need for sympathy from all members to bend for the common result. This most difficult problem, he said, is beautifully met and solved on this recording. The music they created in those next few hours, working with each other, playing off each other, synchronizing with each other, challenging each other, would last several lifetimes. Kind of Blue is the best-selling jazz album of all time. 
and nearly 50 years later, still sells thousands of copies every week. Why can creative teams achieve more together than they can separately? I think it's because they bring together the three key features of intelligence that I described earlier. In a way, they model the essential features of the creative mind. Great creative teams are diverse. They're composed of very different sorts of people with different but complementary talents. The team that created Kind of Blue was made up of extraordinary musicians who not only played different instruments, but brought with them different musical sensibilities and types of personality. This was true too of the Beatles. For all that they had in common, culturally and musically, Lennon and McCartney were very different as people, and so too were George Harrison and Ringo Starr. It was their differences that made their creative work together greater than the sum of their individual parts. Creative teams are dynamic. Diversity of talents is important, but it's not enough. Different ways of thinking can be an obstacle to creativity. Creative teams find ways of using their differences as strengths, not weaknesses. They have a process through which their strengths are complementary and compensate for each other's weaknesses too. They're able to challenge each other as equals and to take criticism as an incentive to raise their game. Creative teams are distinct. There's a big difference between a great team and a committee. Most committees do routine work and have members who are theoretically interchangeable with other people. Committee members are usually there to represent specific interests. Often a committee can do its work while half the members are checking their blackberries or studying the wallpaper. Committees are often immortal. They seem to persist forever, and so often do their meetings. Creative teams have a distinctive personality and come together to do something specific. They're together only for as long as they want to be or have to be to get the job done. One of the most famous examples of powerful teamwork is the administration of President Abraham Lincoln. In her book, Team of Rivals, Doris Kearns Goodwin tells the story of Lincoln and four members of his cabinet, Edward M. Stanton, Secretary of War, Salmon P. Chase, Secretary of the Treasury, William H. Seward, Secretary of State, and Edward Bates, the Attorney General. These five men were unquestionably part of the same tribe, passionate in their desire to lead and move America forward. However, each of the four others had opposed Lincoln openly and bitterly prior to his presidency. Stanton once even called Lincoln a long-armed ape. Each had strongly held positions that sometimes differed greatly from Lincoln's. In addition, each of them believed they were more deserving of the presidency than the man the people had elected. Still, Lincoln believed that each of these rivals had strengths the administration needed. With an equanimity difficult to imagine in current American politics, he brought this team together. They argued ceaselessly and often viciously. What they found in working with each other, though, was the ability to forge their differing opinions into sturdy national policy, navigating the country through its most perilous period through the effort of their combined wisdom. Lost in the crowd There's an important difference between being in a tribe, as I'm defining it, and being part of a crowd, even when the members of a crowd are all there for the same reason and feel the same passions. Sports fans come to mind immediately. There are vociferous and passionate fans all over the sports landscape. Football devotees in Green Bay, soccer, or as those are from the rest of the world know it, football, enthusiasts in Manchester, ice hockey zealots in Montreal and so on. They cover their walls, their cars and their front lawns with team paraphernalia. They might know the regular lineup for their local teams when they finished in fourth place in 1988. They might have postponed their weddings because the date conflicted with the World Series or the European Cup. They're dedicated to their teams, rhapsodic about their teams, and their moods might be dictated by the performance of their teams. But their fandom doesn't place them in a tribe with their fellow fans, at least not in the way that I'm describing it here. Fan behaviour is a different form of social affiliation. Some people, including Henri Tafel and John Turner, refer to this as social identity theory. They argue that people often derive a large sense of who they are through affiliation with specific groups, and tend to associate themselves closely with groups likely to boost their self-esteem. Sports teams make fans feel as though they're part of a vast, powerful organisation. This is especially true when the teams are winning. Look around at the end of any sports season, and you'll notice team jerseys of that season's champion sprouting all over the street, even in places far distant from the team's home city. Fans boast their affiliation with victorious teams 
much more loudly because at some level they believe that being associated in a tangential way with such a team makes them look better. The social psychologist Robert Cialdini has a term for this. He calls it basking in reflected glory, or berging. In the 1970s, Cialdini and others conducted a study about berging and found that students at a number of American universities were much more likely to wear university-related clothing on the Monday after their school won a football game. They also found that students were more likely to use the pronoun we regarding the team, as in we destroyed state on Saturday, than they were if their team lost. In the latter instance, the pronoun usually switched to they, as in I can't believe they blew that game. The point about berging, as it relates to our definition of tribes, is that the person doing the basking has little or nothing to do with the glory achieved. We'll give a tiny bit of credit to the effect of fan support if the fan attended the actual sports event. Though serious sports fans are a notoriously superstitious lot, only the most irrational among them actually believe that their actions, wearing the same hat to every game, sitting perfectly still during a rally, using a specific brand of charcoal during the tailgate party, have any impact on the results. Membership of a fan group, whether it's the Cheeseheads or Red Sox Nation, is not the same as being in a tribe. In fact, such membership can create the opposite effect. Tribe membership, as I define it here, helps people become more themselves, leading them towards a greater sense of personal identity. On the other hand, we can easily lose our identity in a crowd, including a group of fans. Being a fan is about being partisan, cheering or jeering and finding joy in victory and agony in defeat. This might be fulfilling and thrilling in many ways, but it normally doesn't take you to the element as a means of self-realization. In fact, fandom is in many ways a form of what psychologists rather awkwardly call de-individuation. This means losing your sense of identity through becoming part of a group. Extreme forms of de-individuation lead to mob behaviour. If you've ever been to a European soccer match, you know how this can apply to the sports world. But even in more benign versions, it results in a sense of anonymity that leads people to lose inhibitions and sometimes perform acts they later regret, and in most cases do things outside their normal personalities. In other words, these actions can take you far from your true self. My youngest brother Neil used to be a professional soccer player for Everton, one of the major teams in Britain. Whenever I was in Liverpool, I would watch him play. It was an exhilarating and often terrifying experience. Football fans in Liverpool are very enthusiastic, let's say. They're passionate about winning, and when things on the pitch aren't going as well as they'd like, they willingly offer tactical advice from the terraces. It's a form of mentoring for the players and often for the referee too. If Neil failed to place a shot exactly where the fans wanted it, they would scream words of encouragement. Poor shot, Robinson, they might say, or come on, you can do better than that, surely. Or words to that effect. On one occasion, there was an hysterical outburst from someone immediately behind me, offering a robust criticism of my younger brother's tactics, in words that implicated my mother, and by extension me. On instinct, I whirled around to deal with what was clearly a question of family honour. When I saw the manic fan's size and facial expressions, however, I, I agreed that he was probably right. Crowd behaviour is like that. Look, listen and learn. Some spectators really are skilled critics, and what they think about an event can genuinely help others to make better sense of it. The domains of literary criticism, music journalism and sports commentary all have distinguished members whose words speak to us deeply and who belong to tribes passionately dedicated to extending the discourse. This is different from simple fandom. It's a performance in the service of fandom that has definable levels of excellence and the makings of a true calling. Sportscaster Howard Kossel called one of his autobiographies I Never Played the Game. Yet he served for decades as one of the most important and influential voices in the US sports world. My guess is that Kossel found his element in sports, even though he wasn't an athlete. He knew he could enhance the average fan's sports experience and found a greater sense of who he was in doing so. Kossel once said, I was infected with my desire, my resolve, to make it in broadcasting. I knew exactly what I wanted to do and how. 
He was one of a key group of enthusiasts who became active participants in the world they admired by bridging the space between the players and the audience. And in every crowd and every audience, there may be someone who is responding differently from everybody else, someone who is having his own epiphany, someone who sees his tribe not on the bleachers around him, but on the stage in front of him. Billy Connolly is one of the most original and one of the funniest comedians in the world. He was born in a working-class area of Glasgow, Scotland, in 1942. He struggled through school, which he mostly disliked, and left as soon as he could to become an apprentice welder in the Glasgow shipyards. He served his time there, learning his trade and also absorbing the ways and customs of working life on the banks of the River Clyde. From an early age, Connolly loved music and taught himself to play the guitar and the banjo. Like Bob Dylan, growing up at the same time and an ocean away, he was captivated by folk music and spent whatever time he could listening and playing at folk clubs around Scotland. He also loved the pubs and the banter of Glasgow nightlife and made regular visits to the cinema, to Saturday night dances and to occasional live theatre. One night, Connolly was watching the comedian Chick Murray on television. For more than 40 years, Chick Murray had been a legend of comedy and music hall. His droll, acerbic wit epitomised the laconic take on life that typifies Scottish humour. Billy took his seat, ready for a riotous session with the great man. He had all of that, but he had something else, an epiphany. As he rolled around in his seat, he was acutely aware of the hysterical pleasure, the emotional release and the lacerating insights that Murray was detonating around himself. For Billy in Glasgow... This was as much of a turning point as listening to Woody Guthrie was for Bob Dylan in Greenwich Village. He realised that it was possible to do this, and that he was going to do it. He began to separate from the crowd, and to merge with his tribe. Billy had always talked to his own small audiences between songs. Increasingly, he found himself talking more and singing less. He found, too, that the audiences were getting bigger. For many comedians of his generation... He went on to become the doyen of free-willing stand-up comedy. His work has taken him from the shipyards of the Clyde into packed theatres around the world, into award-winning movies as an actor, and into the minds and affections of millions of people. Like most of the people in this book, he found his way not only when he found his element, but also when he found his tribe. Chapter 6 What Will They Think? Finding your element can be challenging on a variety of levels, several of which we've already discussed. Sometimes the challenge comes from within, from a lack of confidence or fear of failure. Sometimes the people closest to you and their image and expectations of you are the real barrier. Sometimes the obstacles are not the particular people you know, but the general culture that surrounds you. I think of the barriers to finding the element as three concentric circles of constraint. These circles are personal, social, and cultural. This time it's personal. Given the way his life has worked out, it's interesting that several of Chuck Close's teachers and classmates considered him a slacker when he was a child. The kids thought so because he had physical problems that made him poor at sports and even the most rudimentary playground games. The teachers probably thought so because he tested poorly, seemed lazy, and rarely finished his exams. It turned out later that he was dyslexic, but the diagnosis for this didn't exist when he was younger. To many outsiders, it didn't seem that Chuck Close was trying very hard to do anything with his life, and most thought that he wouldn't amount to much. On top of his learning disorder and his physical maladies, Close also faced more tragedy than any young boy should ever encounter. His father uprooted the family regularly, and then died when Chuck was eleven. Around this time, his mother, a classical pianist, developed breast cancer, and the Close family lost their home when the medical bills overwhelmed them. Even his grandmother became terribly ill. What got Close through all of this was his passion for art. I think early on my art ability, he said, was something that separated me from everybody else. It was an area in which I felt competent, and it was something that I could fall back on. He even devised innovative ways to use art to overcome the restrictions of his conditions. He created puppet shows and magic acts, what he called entertaining the troops, to get the other kids to spend time with him. 
he supplemented his schoolwork with elaborate art projects to show teachers that he wasn't a malingerer. Ultimately, his interest in art and his innate gifts allowed him to blossom into one of the singular talents in American culture. After graduating from the University of Washington and getting his MFA at Yale, several of his early teachers had told him that college would be out of the question for him, Close set off on a career that was to establish him as one of America's most celebrated artists. His signature style involved a grid system he devised to create huge photorealistic images of faces alive with texture and expression. His method has drawn widespread attention from the media, and his paintings hang in top museums around the world. Through ceaseless dedication to his passion and his craft, Chuck Close overcame considerable constraints to find his element and rise to the pinnacle of his profession. But that's only the beginning of the story. In 1988, Chuck was making an award presentation in New York when he felt something wrong inside his body. He made his way to the hospital, but within hours he was a quadriplegic, the victim of a blood clot in his spinal column. One of the greatest artists of his generation could no longer even grasp a paintbrush. Early rehabilitation efforts proved frustrating, and this latest roadblock in a life filled with roadblocks seemed to be the one that would at last stifle his ambitions. One day, however, Close discovered that he could hold a paintbrush with his teeth and actually manipulate it well enough to create tiny images. I suddenly became very encouraged, he said. I tried to imagine what kind of teeny paintings I could make with only that much movement. I tried to imagine what those paintings might look like. Even that little bit of neck movement was enough to let me know that perhaps I wasn't powerless. Perhaps I could do something myself. What he could do was create an entirely new form of artwork. When he later regained some movement in his upper arm, Close began using rich colours to make small paintings that fit together to create a large mosaic image. His new work was at least as popular as his older work and earned him additional acclaim and notoriety. Throughout his life, Chuck Close has had endless reasons to give in to his problems and to give up as an artist. He chose instead to push on beyond every limit his life presented and to stay in his element no matter what new obstacles reared up in his way. He wouldn't let any of these things prevent him from being who he felt he was meant to be. Chuck Close is not alone in overcoming physical obstacles to pursue his passion. We'll meet some other people who've done this and some of them may surprise you. The problems they face are not only physical, though physical disabilities can be torturous and aggravating in themselves. They also face problems arising from their own attitudes to their disability and from the effects on their feelings of other people's attitudes to their disabilities. To overcome these physical and psychological barriers, people with disabilities of every sort must often summon enormous reserves of self-belief and determination to do things that other people can do without a second thought. Kanduko is a professional contemporary dance company based in Great Britain that includes disabled and non-disabled dancers. Over the years, the dancers have included single and double amputees, paraplegics in wheelchairs, and people with a wide range of other conditions. The vision of the company, founded in 1982, is to inspire audiences and support participants to achieve their highest aspirations in line with the company's ethos that dance is accessible to everyone. Kanduko works to broaden the perception of dance through its performances and through its education and training program. The directors of the company say that Kanduko has always aimed high. High in quality of movement, high in integrity of dance as an art form, and high in expectations of ourselves as performers. Our focus, they say, is on dance, not disability. Professionalism, not therapy. One of a growing number of integrated companies in dance, theatre and music, their ambitions have been fulfilled through numerous international awards, from professional dance critics and festivals around the world. To truly appreciate the Kanduko Dance Company, one reviewer noted, it's been said that one should discard all conventional notions of the dancing body. Why talk about swift and articulate footwork with pointed toes when legs are of no consequence? In these performances, representations of the perfect and physically complete body are thrown out of the window, introducing less than whole figures with no less talent than their able-bodied counterparts. Those who expected the Kanduko dancers to perform gravity-defying stunts with crutches and wheelchairs would have been sorely disappointed, 
Instead, their performance was a visual and psychological confrontation that was not so much a slap in the face, but a lingering thought that warms the heart and caresses the mind. Whether you're disabled or not, issues of attitude are of paramount importance in finding your element. A strong will to be yourself is an indomitable force. Without it, even a person in perfect physical shape is at a comparative disadvantage. In my experience, most people have to face internal obstacles of self-doubt and fear as much as any external obstacles of circumstance and opportunity. The scale of these anxieties is clear from the burgeoning worldwide market for self-help courses and books, many of which focus on just these issues. For me, the best in breed is Susan Jeffers' landmark book, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. It's been translated into 35 languages and has sold millions of copies. In it... Jeffers writes with passion and eloquence about the gnawing fears that hold so many people back from living their lives in full and contributing to the world. These fears include the fear of failure, the fear of not being good enough, the fear of being found wanting, the fear of disapproval, the fear of poverty, and the fear of the unknown. Fear is perhaps the most common obstacle to finding your element. You might ask how often it's played a part in your own life and held you back from doing the things you desperately wanted to try. Dr. Jeffers offers a series of well-tested techniques to move from fear to fulfilment, of which the most powerful is explicit in the title of her book. Social. It's for your own good. Fear of disapproval and of being found wanting are often entangled in our relationships with the people closest to us. Your parents and siblings and your partner and children, if you have them, are likely to have strong views on what you should and shouldn't do with your life. They may be right, of course and they can have positive roles as mentors in encouraging your real talents. However, they can also be very wrong. People can have complex reasons for trying to clip other people's wings. Your taking a different path might not meet their interests, or might create complications in their lives that they feel they can't afford. Whatever the reasons, someone keeping you from the thing you love to do, or even from looking for it, can be a deep source of frustration. There may be no conscious agenda from others at all. You may simply find yourself enmeshed in a self-sustaining web of social roles and expectations that forms a tacit boundary to your ambitions. Many people don't find their element because they don't have the encouragement or the confidence to step outside their established circle of relationships. Sometimes, of course, your loved ones genuinely think you'd be wasting your time and talents doing something of which they disapprove. This is what happened to Paolo Coelho. Mind you, his parents went further than most to put him off. They had him committed repeatedly to a psychiatric institution and subjected to electroshock therapy, because they loved him. The next time you feel guilty about scolding your children, you can probably take some comfort in not resorting to the Coelho parenting system. The reason Coelho's parents institutionalised him was that he had a passionate interest as a teenager in becoming a writer. Pedro and Legia Coelho believed this was a waste of his life. They suggested he could do a bit of writing in his spare time if he felt the need to dabble in such a thing, but his real future lay in becoming a lawyer. When Paolo continued to pursue the arts, his parents felt they had no choice but to commit him to a mental institution to drive these destructive notions from his head. They wanted to help me, Coelho has said. They had their dreams. I wanted to do this and that, but my parents had different plans for my life. So there was a moment when they couldn't control me anymore, and they were desperate. Coelho's parents put Paolo in an asylum three times. They knew their son was extremely bright, believed he had a promising career ahead of him, and did what they felt they had to do to put him on the right track. Yet not even such an extreme approach to intervention stopped Paolo Coelho from finding his element. In spite of the intense family opposition, he continued to pursue writing. His parents were right in assuming he had a promising future ahead of him, but that future had nothing to do with the legal profession. Coelho's novel, The Alchemist, was a major international bestseller, selling more than 40 million copies around the world. His books have been translated into more than 60 languages, and he's the best-selling Portuguese language writer in history. His creative reach extends to television, newspapers, and even popular music. He's written lyrics for several hit Brazilian rock songs. It's entirely possible that Paolo Coelho would have made an excellent lawyer. His dream, though, was to write, 
and even though his parents tried extraordinarily hard to put him on the right course, he kept his focus on his element. Few of us are encouraged to conform to our family's expectations as firmly as Paola Coelho was. But many people face barriers from family and friends. Don't take a dance programme. You can't make a living as a dancer. You're good at math. You should become an accountant. I'm not paying for you to be a philosophy major. And the rest. When people close to you discourage you from taking a particular path, they usually believe they're doing it for your own good. There are some with less noble reasons, but most believe they know what's best. And the fact is that your average office worker probably does have more financial security than the average jazz trumpeter. But it's difficult to feel accomplished when you're not accomplishing something that matters to you. Doing something for your own good is rarely for your own good if it causes you to be less than who you really are. The decision to play it safe, to take the path of least resistance, can seem irresistible, particularly if you have your own doubts and fears about the alternatives. And for some people, it seems easier to avoid ruffling feathers and have the approval of parents, siblings and spouses. But not for everyone. Some of the people in this book had to pull away from their families, for a while at least, to become the person they needed to be. Their decision to take the less comfortable route and accept the price of troubled relationships, tense family holidays and, in Coelho's case, even lost brain cells, eventually led them to considerable levels of fulfilment and accomplishment. What each of them managed to do was weigh the cost of disregarding their loved ones against the cost of relinquishing their dreams. When Ariana Stasinopoulos was a teenager in Greece in the 1960s, she had a sudden and passionate dream. Leafing through a magazine, she saw a picture of Cambridge University in England. She was only 13 years old, but she decided on the spot that she had to be a student there. Everybody she told about this, including her friends and her father, said it was a ridiculous idea. She was a girl. It was too expensive. She had no connections there. And this was one of the most prestigious universities in the world. No one took her seriously. No one except Ariana herself, that is. And one other person. Her mother decided that they had to find out if Ariana's dream was even remotely possible. She made some inquiries and learned that Ariana could apply for a scholarship. She even found some cheap air tickets. So we could go to England and see Cambridge in person, Ariana said. It was a perfect example of what we now call visualisation. It was a long flight to London, and it rained the entire time they were in Cambridge. Ariana and her mother didn't meet anyone from the university. They simply walked around and imagined what it would be like to be there. With her dream reinforced, Ariana replied as soon as she was eligible. To her delight, and everyone's astonishment, except her mother's, Cambridge accepted Ariana, and she won a scholarship. At the age of 16, she moved to England and went on to graduate from Cambridge University with an MA in economics. At 21, she became the first woman president of the famed debating society, the Cambridge Union. Now based in the United States, Ariana Huffington is the author of 11 books on cultural history and politics, a nationally syndicated columnist and co-host of Left, Right and Centre, National Public Radio's popular political roundtable programme. In May 2005, she launched the Huffington Post, a news and blog site that's become one of the most widely read and frequently cited media brands on the internet. In 2006, Time magazine put her on their list of the world's 100 most influential people. For all her success, Huffington knows that the biggest obstacles to achievement can be self-doubt and the disapproval of other people. She says this is especially true for women. I'm struck, she says, by how often when I asked women to blog for the Huffington Post, they had a hard time trusting that what they had to say was worthwhile, even established writers. So often, I think, we as women stop ourselves from trying because we don't want to risk failing. We put such a premium on being approved of, we become reluctant to take risks. Women still have an uneasy relationship with power and the traits necessary to be a leader, says Ariana. There's this internalised fear that if we're really powerful, we're going to be considered ruthless or pushy or strident, all those epithets that strike right at our femininity. We're still working at trying to overcome the fear that power and womanliness are mutually exclusive. Huffington says that there were two key factors in pursuing her early dream. The first was that she didn't really understand what she was getting herself into. My first taste of leadership, she says, 
came in a situation in which I was a blissfully ignorant outsider. It was in college when I became president of the Cambridge Union Debating Society. Since I'd grown up in Greece, I'd never heard of the Cambridge Union or the Oxford Union and didn't know about their place in English culture, so I wasn't weighed down with the kinds of overwhelming notions that may have stopped British girls from even thinking about trying for such a position. In this way, it was a blessing that I started my career outside my home environment. It had its own problems in that I was ridiculed for my accent and I was demeaned as someone who spoke in a funny way. But it also taught me that it's easier to overcome other people's judgments than to overcome our own self-judgment, the fear we internalise. The second factor was the unwavering support of her mother. I don't think that anything I've done in my life, she says, would have been possible without my mother. My mother gave me that safe place, that sense that she would be there no matter what happened, whether I succeeded or failed. She gave me what I'm hoping to be able to give my own daughters, which is a sense that I could aim for the stars combined with the knowledge that if I didn't reach them, she wouldn't love me any less. She helped me understand that failure was part of any life. Groupthink. Positively or negatively, our parents and families are powerful influences on us. But even stronger, especially when we're young, are our friends. We don't choose our families, but we do choose our friends. And we often choose them as a way of expanding our sense of identity beyond the family. As a result, the pressure to conform to the standards and expectations of friends and other social groups can be intense. Judith Rich Harris is a developmental psychologist who has looked at the influences on young people of their friends and peer groups. She argues that three main forces shape our development, personal temperament, our parents and our peers. The influence of peers, she argues, is much stronger than that of parents. The world that children share with their peers, she says, is what shapes their behaviour and modifies the characteristics they were born with and hence determines the sort of people they'll be when they grow up. Children get their ideas of how to behave by identifying with the group and taking on its attitudes, behaviours, speech and styles of dress and adornment. Most of them do this automatically and willingly. They want to be like their peers. But just in case they have any funny ideas, their peers are quick to remind them of the penalties of being different. The nail that sticks up gets hammered down. Since breaking the rules is a sure way to find ourselves out of the group, we may deny our deepest passions to stay connected with our peers. At school, we disguise an interest in physics because our circle finds it uncool. We spend afternoons playing basketball when what we really want to do is master the five mother sources. We never mention our fascination with hip-hop because the people we travel with consider something so street to be beneath them. Being in your element may depend on stepping out of the circle. Sean Carter was born in the housing projects in Brooklyn, New York. Now known as Jay-Z, he's one of the most successful musicians and business people of his generation and an icon to millions of people around the world. To become all of that, he first had to confront the disapproval and the scepticism of the friends and peers he grew up with on the Brooklyn streets. When I left the block, everyone was saying I was crazy, he said of his early success. I was doing well for myself on the streets and the cats around me were like... These rappers are hoes, they just record, tour and get separated from their families while some white person takes all their money. I was determined to do it differently. His role model was the music entrepreneur Russell Simmons. And like him, Jay-Z now heads a diverse business empire that's rooted in his success as a musician, but goes beyond it to include a clothing line and a record label. All of this has generated a huge personal fortune for Jay-Z and the renewed respect of many of the friends in Brooklyn he had to move aside to make his way. In extreme cases, peer groups can become trapped in what psychologist Irving Janis has called groupthink, a mode of thinking that people engage in when they are deeply involved in a cohesive in-group, when the members' strivings for unanimity override their motivation to realistically appraise alternative courses of action. The prevailing belief here is that the group knows best, that a decision or a direction that seems to represent the majority of the group stands beyond careful examination, even when your instincts suggest otherwise. There are several famous and sometimes infamous studies of the effects of groupthink, including the Solomon Ash conformity experiments. In 1951, psychologist Ash brought together college students in groups of 8 to 10, telling them he was studying visual perception. 
All but one of the students were plants. They knew the nature of the experiment, and Ash had instructed them to give incorrect answers the majority of the time. The real subject, the only one who Ash had not prepared ahead of time, answered each question only after hearing most of the other answers in the group. Ash showed the students a card with a line on it. He then held up another card with three lines of different lengths and asked them to say which one was the same length as the line on the other card. One was an obvious match, but the planted students had been instructed by Ash to say that the match was one of the other lines. When it was time for the subject to answer, the effects of groupthink kicked in. In a majority of cases, the subject answered with the group and against clear visual evidence at least once during the session. When interviewed later, most of the subjects said they knew they were giving the wrong answers, but did so because they didn't want to be singled out. The tendency to conformity in our society is so strong, Ash wrote, that reasonably intelligent and well-meaning young people are willing to call white black. This is a matter of concern. It raises questions about our ways of education and about the values that guide our conduct. Management writer Jerry B. Harvey gives another famous example known as the Abilene Paradox. On a hot afternoon in Coleman, Texas, the story goes, a family is comfortably playing dominoes on a porch until the father-in-law suggests they take a trip to Abilene, 53 miles north, for dinner. As Harvey describes it, the wife says, sounds like a great idea. The husband, despite having reservations because the drive is long and hot, thinks that his preferences must be out of step with the group and says, sounds good to me. I just hope your mother wants to go. The mother-in-law then says, Of course I want to go. I haven't been to Abilene in a long time. The drive is hot, dusty and long. When they arrive at the cafeteria, the food is as bad. They arrive back home four hours later, exhausted. One of them dishonestly says, It was a great trip, wasn't it? The mother-in-law says that actually she would rather have stayed home, but went along since the other three were so enthusiastic. The husband says, I didn't want to go. I only went to satisfy the rest of you. The wife says, I just went along to keep you happy. I would have to be crazy to want to go out in the heat like that. The father-in-law says that he only suggested it because he thought the others might be bored. The group sits back, perplexed that they together decided to take a trip which none of them wanted. They each would have preferred to sit comfortably, but didn't admit to it when they still had time to enjoy the afternoon. This is a benign but dramatic illustration of the consequences of groupthink. Every member of the group agreed to do something they didn't want to do because they thought the others were committed to doing it. The result was that no one came away happy. Allowing groupthink to inform our decisions about our futures can lead to equally unpleasant and much more consequential results. Accepting the group opinion that physics is not cool, playing basketball is better than learning to be a chef and hip-hop is beneath you, is counterproductive not only to the individual but to the group. Perhaps like those in the Abilene Paradox, others in the circle secretly disagree too, but are afraid to stand alone against the group. Groupthink can diminish the group as a whole. The major obstacles to finding the element often emerge in school. This is partly because of the hierarchy of subjects, which means that many students never discover their true interests and talents. But within the general culture of education, Different social groups form distinctive subcultures. For some groups, the code is that it's just not cool to study. If you're doing science, you're a geek. If you're doing art or dance, you're a feat. For other groups, doing these things is absolutely essential. The power of groups is that they validate the common interests of their members. The danger of groupthink is that it dulls their individual judgment. The group thinks in unison and behaves en masse. In this respect, schools of people are like schools of fish. A single ant can't ruin a picnic. You've probably seen images of huge schools of fish swimming in tight formation that instantly move in a new direction like a single organism. Perhaps you've seen swarms of insects crossing the sky that spontaneously swoop and swirl like an orchestrated cloud. It's an impressive display that seems like controlled and intelligent behaviour. But the individual herrings or mosquitoes are not acting on free will as we think of it in humans. We don't know what may be on their minds as they go along with the crowd, 
but we do know that when they do it, they act almost as a single creature. Researchers are now understanding more about how this happens. The probability is that fish make those dramatic tight shifts in direction by following the movements of the fish that lie directly in their field of perception. What appears to be a masterwork of choreography is probably little more than an especially elegant version of Follow the Leader. To illustrate the point, there are now computer programs that simulate the effects of swarms and schools with remarkable accuracy. A similar principle seems to drive the operations of one of the oldest and most successful creatures on Earth, the ant. If you've seen an ant wandering aimlessly across your kitchen floor in search of a morsel to eat, you don't get a sense of a highly developed intelligence at work. Yet the work of ant colonies is a miracle of efficiency and success. Ants depend on what's known as swarm intelligence, the nature of which is currently the subject of intense study. While they've yet to understand fully how ants have developed such sophisticated teamwork, researchers do know that ants achieve their goals by fulfilling their own very specific roles with military precision. For instance, when looking for food, one ant starts on a path, leaving a trail of pheromones. The next ant follows this trail, leaving a trail of its own. In this way, a large collection finds its way to the food source and carries it back as a team to the colony. Each ant works towards a global goal, while no one ant takes the lead. In fact, there seems to be no hierarchy at all within ant colonies. Even the queen's one function seems to be to lay eggs. These patterns of coordinated group behaviour in fish, ants, mosquitoes and most other creatures are principally to do with protection and security, with mating and survival and with getting food and not becoming food themselves. It's much the same with human beings. We aggregate as groups for the same essential and primal purposes. The upside for us is that groups can be tremendously supportive. The downside is that they encourage uniformity of thought and behaviour. The element is about discovering yourself, and you can't do this if you're trapped into a compulsion to conform. You can't be yourself in a swarm. Culture, right and thong. Beyond the specific social constraints that we may feel from families and friends, there are others that are implicit in the general culture. I define culture as the values and forms of behaviour that characterise different social groups. Culture is a system of permissions. It's about the attitudes and behaviours that are acceptable and unacceptable in different communities those that are approved of, and those that are not. If you don't understand the cultural codes, you can look just awful. I'll always remember a man I saw who got it miserably wrong on a beach in Malibu in California. He strutted slowly into our midst, a vision of the unexpected that caused a beach full of strangers to form a deep bond of helpless camaraderie. He was about 40. My guess was that he was some sort of executive and I can imagine that in certain settings he cut a distinguished figure. But here he did not. In a land of physical culture and treadmills, he was pale, hairy, and inhabited a sagging body that clearly spent its days at a desk and its nights on a bar stool. One can forgive a man for all of these things, but not for wearing a nylon leopard print thong. The thong clung to his groin like an oxygen mask. A stretch of elastic held it in place, skirting his waist and threading tightly between his bare buttocks. He paraded down the length of the beach, apparently delighted that every eye was turning to him in a slow Mexican wave of amazement. He gave the impression of a self-appointed role model of physical attraction and sexual magnetism, bathing in the bright sunlight of popular acclaim. This wasn't the majority opinion, however. At least he might have waxed, said the man next to me. Why was this so hypnotically amusing for us all? It wasn't just that he had such an outrageously high opinion of his own attractiveness. It was also that he was so far out of context. The outfit and attitude might have worked in the south of France, but in Malibu, for various reasons, it was all wrong. There's an unspoken code for men on California beaches. It's a curious mixture of peacock display and public modesty. Oiled torsos and rippling muscles are fine, but naked buttocks are not. All over America, there's this intricate mixture of prurience and prudishness. Shortly afterward, my wife Terry and I were in Barcelona. There are beaches there that line the harbour in the city centre, 
and every lunchtime during the summer the local offices spill out, and young men and women head to the city beaches and sunbathe topless, in thongs at the very most. In Spain, that's completely accepted. It would be odd there to see someone in a pair of knee-length shorts and a t-shirt. The culture simply accepts that people can wander around virtually naked on the beach. All social cultures promote what I describe as contagious behaviour. One of the best examples is language, and more particularly accents and dialects. These are wonderful illustrations of the impulse to copy and conform. It would be odd for someone born and raised in the highlands of Scotland or the badlands of Montana not to speak the local dialect of English with the local accent. We'd be amazed, of course, if a child born there spontaneously started speaking French or Hebrew. But we'd be just as taken aback if the child spoke the local language in an entirely different dialect or accent from everyone else. The natural instinct of children is to copy and imitate, and as they grow they absorb not only the sounds they hear, but the sensibilities they express and the culture they convey. Languages are the bearers of the cultural genes. As we learn a language, accents and ways of speaking, we also learn ways of thinking, feeling and relating. The cultures in which we are raised not only affect our values and outlook, they also shape our bodies and may even restructure our brains. Language again is a prime example. As we learn to speak, our mouths and vocal organs adapt to make the sounds our languages use. If you grow up speaking only one or two languages, it can be physically difficult to create the sounds that other languages require and that other cultures take for granted. Those guttural French sounds, or the lispy sounds of Spanish, or the tonal sounds of some Asian languages. To speak a new language, we may have to retrain our bodies to make and understand the new sounds. But the effects of culture may go deeper still, into the actual structures of the brain. In the last few years, there's been a series of fascinating studies into differences in visual perception between people from the West and from East Asia. These studies suggest that the cultures we grow up in affect the basic processes by which we see the world around us. In one such study, Westerners and Asians were asked to look at a series of photographs and describe what they saw. A number of marked differences emerged. In essence, Westerners tend to focus more on the foreground of the pictures and on what they consider to be the subject. Asians focus more on the whole image, including the relationships between the different elements. For example, one photograph showed a jungle scene with a tiger. Typically, the Western observers, when asked what they saw, said, a tiger. To Western listeners of this book, that may seem reasonable enough. However, Asian observers typically said it's a jungle with a tiger in it, or it's a tiger in a jungle. The difference is significant, and it relates to larger cultural differences in the Western and Asian worldviews. In Asian art, there's often much less emphasis on portraiture and the individual subject of the sort that's common in Western art. In Asian cultures, there's less emphasis on the individual and more on the collective. Western philosophy since the ancient Greeks has emphasised the importance of critical reasoning, logical analysis, and the separation of ideas and things into categories. Chinese philosophy is not based as much on logic and deductive reasoning and tends to emphasise relationships and holism. These differences in perception may lead to differences in memory and judgement. At least one study suggests that over time, they may also lead to structural differences in the brain. Researchers in Illinois and Singapore monitored brain activity in young and elderly volunteers as they looked at a series of images with different subjects and backgrounds. Using functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, they focused on the part of the brain known as the lateral occipital complex, which processes visual information about objects. All the younger participants showed similar brain activity, but there were marked differences in neural responses between the older Western and Asian observers. In the Westerners, the lateral occipital complex remained active, while in the Asian participants it responded only minimally. Dr Michael Chi is a professor with the Cognitive Neuroscience Laboratory in Singapore and co-author of the study. He concluded, the parts of the brain involved in processing background and objects are engaged differently across the two sets of elderly people coming from different geographical and, by inference, cultural backgrounds. Dr Denise Park is Professor of Psychology at the University of Illinois and a senior researcher on the project. In her view, these different results may be because East Asian cultures are more interdependent 
and individuals spend more time monitoring the environment and others. Westerners, she says, focus on individuals and central objects because these cultures tend to be independent and focused more on the self than others. She says that these studies show that culture can sculpt the brain. Whether and to what extent this happens is now attracting a wider field of researchers. What's already clear is that what we actually see of the world is affected by culture, not only what we think of what we see. Culture conditions all of us in ways that are imperceptible. Swimming against the tide. All cultures have an unwritten survival manual for success, to quote cultural anthropologist Clotaire Rapai. The rules and guidelines are transparent to most of us, if not to the thong man, and those who move from one culture to another can gain insight into the different rules and guidelines relatively easily. This survival manual comes from generations of adaptation to the particular climate in which the culture resides. But in addition to helping those within the culture thrive, it also sets out a series of constraints. Such constraints can inhibit us from reaching our element because our passions seem inconsistent with the culture. The great social movements are those that are stimulated when the boundaries are broken. Rock music, punk, hip-hop and the other great shifts in the social culture usually derive their energy from young people looking for some alternative way of being. Youthful rebellion often expresses itself through distinctive styles of speech and dress codes, which usually turn out to be just as conformist and orthodox within their subculture as they are at odds with the dominant culture they're trying to escape. It's very hard to pass as a hippie if you're wearing an Armani suit. All cultures and subcultures also embody systems of constraints that can inhibit individuals from reaching their element if their passions are in conflict with their context. Some people born in one culture end up adopting another because they prefer its sensibilities and ways of life like cultural cross-dresses. A French person may become an Anglophile or an American a Francophile. Like people who change religions, they can become more zealous about their adopted culture than those who were born into it. The urban culture may not be best for someone who wants to run a small shop where he knows everyone's name. Parts of heartland American culture are not prime territory for those who want careers as scathing political comics. This is why Bob Dylan had to get out of Hibbing and why Ariana Stasinopoulos wanted to leave Greece. Finding your element sometimes requires breaking away from your native culture in order to achieve your goals. Zaha Hadid, the first woman to win the Pritzker Prize for Architecture, grew up in Baghdad in the 1950s. Iraq was a different place then, much more secular and more open to Western thought. During this time, there were many women in Iraq developing ambitious careers. But Hadid wanted to be an architect, and she found no female role models of this sort in her homeland. Driven by her passions, Hadid moved first to London and then to America, where she studied with the greatest architects of her time, honed a revolutionary style and, after a rocky start, her work requires considerable risky conceptual leaps which many clients were loath to make at first, she built some of the most distinctive structures in the world. Hello, hello, everybody. This is Patricia Curti, the founder of Gallery of Ideas. I hope you are enjoying this listening experience as much as I do. There is so much to learn from this brilliant mind that every minute we spend listening to their wisdom is absolutely priceless. Before I reset this room, I'd like to thank you all for being here today and remind you that um, to take advantage, to look around all the like-minded people who are in the room with you right now, connect with them, follow them, right? Follow the moderators, the ones with the green badge next to their names. All the moderators from Gallery of Ideas are incredible people who can make your journey here on Clubhouse much more enjoyable. They also open several rooms in their native languages. So make sure you tap on their photos, tap on my photo and hit follow. And don't forget to join Gallery of Ideas Club. Memberships here on Clubhouse are free of charge. And you can do that by tapping on the greenhouse at the top of your screen and clicking join. Our rooms are designed to be educational, inspirational and motivational. So make sure you share this room with your friends or share it here on Clubhouse so people can find you and follow you here. The button to share this room is at the bottom of your screen where you can also see the number of shares. Actually, 
Let's do an exercise right now. Let's all share the room together. Let's do it right now and watch this number change. Come on, let's do it all together. Let's do it together now. Fabulous, fabulous. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing here on Clubhouse. Thank you for sharing on other platforms. As they say, sharing is caring, right? Next important thing is that I'd like to invite you all to join me on stage. Raise your hands if you'd like to join me on the stage or just wait for my invitation. I will send some invitations out to you in a moment. Just be mindful of your microphones when you enter the stage because by default, your microphones will be always open. So make sure when you join us on stage, just mute yourself, okay? I don't know if you know that, but listening from the stage on Clubhouse gives you a better audio experience. And for everyone who joins me on the stage, you will also get a shout out on my YouTube channel that is pinned at the top of the page. Make sure to subscribe to that and go to the community tab to see all the live comments and screenshots of this room. You will be able to interact with the live audience right here, right now. Isn't that marvelous? I love this. I love this. Right. So before we go back to the listening, to listen listening to the words of wisdom from these brilliant people, this brilliant mind. Uh, my final mention goes here about the other rooms, the other listening rooms that we have at Gallery of Ideas. We have FBN, Friday by Nico. It's a music room with live interaction from the incredible Nico, broadcasting directly from Rome and Barcelona. We also have Gallery of Ideas Radio Room, broadcasting from Barcelona on the Radio Garden platform with live studio recordings, incredible shows where you can also participate. You can all find the full calendar of events uh, on the clubs page right here on Clubhouse. Just tap on the clubs page and you will be able to see the calendar of events. Last but not least, if you wanted to meet us on the metaverse, you know, everybody's talking about the metaverse right now and we are full on. Let us know because let us know on the community tab on my YouTube channel because we are starting to host a few exclusive Gallery of Ideas events on the metaverse for our students and uh, GOI members. Just send us a message on the community tab and we'll uh, get in touch with you. But now let's go back to the purpose of this room, which is to improve our listening skills and enjoy this experience together. Her work includes the Rosenthal Center for Contemporary Art in Cincinnati, Ohio, which the New York Times called the most important new building in America since the Cold War. Moving out of her culture and into a milieu that celebrated invention gave Handy the opportunity to soar. If she'd stayed in Iraq, she might have had a good career, at least until political circumstances changed for women. But she wouldn't have found her element in architecture, because her native culture simply didn't afford women that option. The contagious behaviour of schools of fish, insect swarms and crowds of people is generated by close physical proximity. For most of human history, cultural identities have also been formed through direct contact with the people who are physically nearest to us, small villages, the local community. Large movements of people once were limited to invasions, military conquests and trade, and these were the main ways in which cultural ideas were disseminated and different languages and ways of life imposed on other communities. All of this has changed irreversibly in the last 200 years or so, with the growth of global communications. We now have patterns of contagious behaviour being generated on a massive scale through the web. Second Life has millions of people online from different parts of the world, potentially affecting how they each think and taking on new virtual identities and roles. Many of us now live like Russian dolls, nestled in multiple layers of cultural identity. I was amused to read recently, for example, that nowadays being British means driving home in a German car, stopping off to pick up some Belgian beer and a Turkish kebab or an Indian takeaway, to spend the evening on Swedish furniture, watching American programmes on a Japanese TV. And the most British thing of all? Suspicion of anything foreign. The complexities and fluidity of contemporary cultures can make it easier to change contexts and break away from the pressures of groupthink and feeling stereotyped. They can also make for a profound sense of confusion and insecurity. 
The message here isn't as simplistic as don't let anything get in your way. Our families, friends, culture and place in the human community are all important to our sense of fulfilment and we have certain responsibilities to all of them. The real message here is that in seeking your element you're likely to face one or more of the three levels of constraint personal, social and cultural. Sometimes, as Chuck Close found, reaching your element requires devising creative solutions to strong limitations. Sometimes, as we learn from Paolo Coelho, it means maintaining a vision in the face of vicious resistance. And sometimes, as Zahar Hadid showed us, it means walking away from the life you've known to find an environment more suited to your growth. Ultimately, the question is always going to be, what price are you willing to pay? The rewards of the element are considerable, but reaping these rewards may mean pushing back against some stiff opposition. Chapter 7 Do you feel lucky? Being good at something and having a passion for it are essential to finding the element. But they're not enough. Getting there depends fundamentally on our view of ourselves and of the events in our lives. The element is also a matter of attitude. When 12-year-old John Wilson walked into his chemistry class at Scarborough High School for Boys in England on a rainy day in late October 1931, he had no way of knowing that his life was about to change completely. The class experiment that day was to show how heating a container of water would bring oxygen bubbling to the surface, something students at this school and at all schools around the world had been doing for a very long time. The container the teacher gave John to heat, however, was not like the container students everywhere had used. Somehow, this container mistakenly held something more volatile than water. It turned out that the container had the wrong solution, because the laboratory assistant had been distracted and put the wrong label on the bottle. And when John heated it with a Bunsen burner, the container exploded, shattering glass bottles in the vicinity, destroying a portion of the classroom, and pelting the students with razor-edged shards. Several students came away from this accident bleeding. John Wilson came away from it, blinded in both eyes. Wilson spent the next two months in the hospital. When he returned home, his parents attempted to find a way to deal with the catastrophe that had befallen their lives. But Wilson didn't regard the accident as catastrophic. It didn't strike me even then as a tragedy, he said once in an interview with the Times of London. He knew he had the rest of his life to live, and he didn't intend to live it in an understated way. He learned Braille quickly, and continued his education at the esteemed Worcester College for the Blind. There, he not only excelled as a student, but also became an accomplished rower, swimmer, actor, musician and orator. From Worcester, Wilson studied law at Oxford. Away from the protected environments of a school set up for blind students, he needed to contend with a busy campus and the very active streets in the vicinity. Rather than relying on a walking stick, though, he relied on an acute sense of hearing, on what he called his obstacle sense, to keep him out of harm's way. At Oxford, he received his law degree and set out to work for the National Institute for the Blind. His real calling, however, was still waiting for him. In 1946, Wilson went on a fact-finding tour of British territories in Africa and the Middle East. What he found there was rampant blindness. And unlike the accident that cost him his eyesight, the diseases that affected so many of these people were preventable with the proper medical attention. For Wilson, it was one thing to accept his own fate, and quite another to allow something to continue when it could be fixed so easily. This moved him to action. The report, Wilson delivered upon his return, led to the formation of the British Empire Society for the Blind, now called Sight Savers International. Wilson himself served as the director of the organisation for more than 30 years and accomplished remarkable things during his tenure. His work often led him to travel more than 50,000 miles a year, but he considered this an essential part of the job believing that he needed to be present in the places where his organisation's work was being done. In 1950, he and his wife lived in a mud hut in a part of Ghana known as the Country of the Blind, because a disease that came from insect bites had blinded 10% of the population. 
He set his team to work on developing a preventative treatment for the disease, commonly known as river blindness. Using the drug Mectazan, the organisation inoculated the children in the seven African countries stricken with the disease and all but eradicated it. By the early 1960s, river blindness was overwhelmingly under control. It's no exaggeration to say that generations of African children can thank the efforts of John Wilson for their sight. Under Wilson's direction, the organisation conducted 3 million cataract operations and treated 12 million others at risk of becoming blind. They also administered more than 100 million doses of vitamin A to prevent childhood blindness and distributed braille study packs to afflicted people throughout Africa and Asia. In all, tens of millions can see because of the commitment John Wilson made to preventing the preventable. When Wilson retired, he and his wife devoted their considerable energies to IMPACT, a program of the World Health Organization that works on the prevention of all types of disabling diseases. Knighted in 1975, he also received the Helen Keller International Award, the Albert Schweitzer International Prize and the World Humanity Award. He continued to be an active and prominent voice for the cause of preventing blindness and all avoidable disability until his death in 1999. John Coles, in his biography, Blindness and the Visionary, The Life and Work of John Wilson, wrote, By any standards, his achievements rate comparison with those of other great humanitarians. Others have compared his accomplishments with those of Mother Teresa. Many people, faced with the circumstances Sir John Wilson encountered, would have bemoaned their existence. Perhaps they would have considered themselves cursed by ill fortune and frustrated in their attempts to do anything significant with their lives. Wilson, however, insisted that blindness was a confounded nuisance, not a crippling affliction, and he modelled that attitude in the most inspiring possible way. He lost his sight and found a vision. He proved dramatically that it's not what happens to us that determines our lives, it's what we make of what happens. Attitude and Aptitude There is a risk in giving examples of people who found their element. Their stories can be inspiring, of course, but they can also be depressing. After all, these people seem blessed in some way. They've had the good fortune to do what they love to do and to be very good at doing it. But one could easily ascribe their good fortune to luck, and certainly many people who love what they do say that they've been lucky just as people who don't like what they're doing with their lives often say they've been unlucky. Of course, some lucky people have been fortunate to find their passions and to have the opportunities to pursue them. Some unlucky people have had bad things happen to them. But good and bad things happen to all of us. It's not what happens to us that makes the difference in our lives. What makes the difference is our attitude toward what happens. The idea of luck is a powerful way of illustrating the importance of our basic attitudes in affecting whether or not we find our element. Describing ourselves as lucky or unlucky suggests that we're simply the beneficiaries or victims of chance circumstances. But if being in your element were just a matter of chance, all you could do is cross your fingers and hope to get lucky as well. There's much more to being lucky than that. Research and experience show that lucky people often make their luck because of their attitudes. Chapter 3 looked at the concept of creativity. The real message there is that we all create and shape the realities of our own lives to an extraordinary extent. Those who simply wait for good things to happen really would be lucky to encounter them. All of the people I profiled in this book have taken an active role in getting lucky. They've mastered a combination of attitudes and behaviour that lead them to opportunities and that give them the confidence to take them. One of these is the ability to look at situations in different ways. There's a difference between what we are able to perceive, our field of perception, and what we actually do perceive. As I mentioned in the last chapter, there are significant cultural differences in how people perceive the world around them. But two different people with the same cultural orientations may still see the same scene in completely different ways, depending upon their preconceptions and their sense of mission. Best-selling author and top motivational speaker Anthony Robbins demonstrates this with a simple activity. In his three-day seminars, he asks the thousands of people in attendance to look around and count how many items of green clothing they can see. 
He gives them a few minutes to do this, and then asks them for their findings. He then asks them how many items of red clothing they saw. Most people can't even begin to answer the question because Robbins told them to look for items of green clothing, and they only focused on those. In his book, The Luck Factor, psychologist Richard Wiseman writes about his study of 400 exceptionally lucky and unlucky people. He found that those who considered themselves lucky tended to exhibit similar attitudes and behaviours. Their unlucky counterparts tended to exhibit opposite traits. Wiseman has identified four principles that characterise lucky people. Lucky people tend to maximise chance opportunities. They're especially adept at creating, noticing and acting upon these opportunities when they arise. Second, they tend to be very effective at listening to their intuition and do work, such as meditation, that's designed to boost their intuitive abilities. The third principle is that lucky people tend to expect to be lucky, creating a series of self-fulfilling prophecies because they go into the world anticipating a positive outcome. Last, lucky people have an attitude that allows them to turn bad luck to good. They don't allow ill fortune to overwhelm them, and they move quickly to take control of the situation when it isn't going well for them. Dr. Wiseman performed an experiment that speaks to the role of perception in luck. He set up a nearby cafe with a group of actors told to behave the way people normally did in that setting. He also put a five-pound note on the sidewalk just outside the cafe. He then asked one of his lucky volunteers to go down to the shop. The lucky person saw the money on the ground, picked it up, walked into the shop and ordered a coffee for himself and the stranger at the next chair. He and the stranger struck up a conversation and wound up exchanging contact information. Next, Dr. Wiseman sent one of his unlucky volunteers to the cafe. This person stepped right over the £5 note, bought coffee and interacted with no one. Later, Wiseman asked both subjects if anything lucky happened that day. The lucky subject talked about finding the money and making a new contact. The unlucky subject couldn't think of anything. One way of opening ourselves up to new opportunities is to make conscious efforts to look differently at our ordinary situations. Doing so allows a person to see the world as one rife with possibility and to take advantage of some of those possibilities if they seem worth pursuing. What Robbins and Wiseman show us is that if we keep our focus too tight, we miss the rest of the world swirling around us. Another attitude that leads to what many of us would consider good luck is the ability to reframe to look at a situation that fails to go according to plan and to turn it into something beneficial. If things had worked out differently, there's a very good chance that I wouldn't be writing this book at all now and you would not be reading it or listening to it. I might be running a sports bar in England and regaling anyone who'd listen with tales of my glittering soccer career. I grew up in Liverpool as one of a large family of boys and one sister. My father had been an amateur soccer player and boxer and like everyone in my extended family, he was devoted to our local soccer team, Everton. It was the dream of every household in the neighbourhood to have one of their own kids play for Everton. Until I was four, everyone in my family assumed the Everton soccer player in our clan would be me. I was strong, very active, and I had a natural aptitude for soccer. This was in 1954, the year in which the polio epidemics reached their peak in Europe and America. One day, my mother came to collect me from my nursery school to find that I was howling in pain from a piercing headache. I never cried much as a child, so my misery concerned her really deeply. Our doctor came to the house and decided I had the flu. By the next morning, it became clear that his diagnosis was off. I woke up completely paralysed. I couldn't move at all. I spent the next few weeks on the emergency list in the polio isolation unit of our local hospital. I'd completely lost the use of my legs and much of my body. For eight months, I found myself in the hospital surrounded by other kids who were struggling with sudden paralysis. Some of them were in iron lungs. Some of them didn't survive. Very slowly, I began to recover some use of my left leg, and thankfully the full use of my arms and the rest of my body. My right leg remains completely paralysed. I eventually left the hospital at the age of five in a wheelchair, wearing two braces. 
This pretty much put an end to my planned career in soccer. Although, given the way Everton's been playing lately, I might still have a shot at making the team. This was a devastating blow to my parents and everyone in my family. As I grew up, one of their biggest concerns was how I would make a living. My father and mother recognised from the outset that I needed to make the best use of my other talents, though it wasn't clear at that point what those talents might be. Their first priority was for me to get the best education possible. As I moved through school, I was under extra pressure to study and do well in my exams. This wasn't easy. After all, I was one of a large, very close family living in a house that was constantly full of visitors, noise and laughter. On top of this, the house was in Merseyside in the early 1960s. Rock music, loud rock music, was everywhere. My brother Ian played drums in a band that rehearsed every week in our house right next door to the room where I was trying to find some relevance in algebra and Latin. In the battle for my attentions between the books and the beat, the books were losing badly. Still, as much as any boy could, I understood that there was a future to consider, and that I needed to do the most with what I had. Soccer was no longer an option, and as much as I loved music, I didn't have any musical talent to speak of. With the benign pressure of my father, I eventually got through school. I went on to college, and it was there that the interests that have shaped my life began to take form. I don't know what kind of soccer player I would have been. I do know that catching polio opened many more doors for me than the one it so firmly closed at the time. I certainly didn't see this when it happened, and neither did anyone in my family. But my parents' ability to reframe our situation by doing their best to focus me on my schoolwork, and my ability to reframe my circumstance, turned a disaster into a completely unexpected set of opportunities, which continued to evolve and to multiply. Someone else who was denied a career in soccer went in a very different direction. Vidal Sassoon is one of the most celebrated names in hairdressing. In the 1960s, his clients included the biggest stars and iconic models of the time, including Mary Quant, Jean Shrimpton and Mia Farrow. His revolutionary creations included the bob, the five-point geometric cut, and the Greek goddess style, taking over from the beehive styles of the 1950s. When Vidal was a child in the East End of London, his father abandoned his mother. An aunt took them all in, and Vidal and four other children lived together in her two-bedroom tenement flat. Things got so bad that eventually his mother sent Vidal and his brother to an orphanage, and it was nearly six years before she was able to get them home again. As a teenager, he had a passionate ambition to be a soccer player, but his mother insisted that he apprentice as a hairdresser. She thought that would be a more secure job for him. I was 14 years old, he said, and in England, unless you were privileged, that was when you left school and started to earn a living. I was apprenticed to this wonderful man called Adolf Cohen on Whitechapel Road, and what a disciplinarian he was. I was 14, it was 1942, and the war was on. Bombs were dropping practically every night, the Luftwaffe was giving London hell, and we still had to come in with our nails clean, our trousers pressed, and our shoes polished. Those two years with him definitely gave me the structure I needed in my life, the inconvenience of discipline. I took some time out after that because I still wasn't sure if I wanted to be a hairdresser. I loved football so much. In the end, I suppose it was the prospect of all the pretty girls, and of course, my mother that swung it for me. At first I couldn't get a proper job in the West End of London at a big salon like Raymond's because I had a Cockney accent. That's the way it was in those days. For three years he took voice lessons to improve how he sounded so he could get a job in one of the better salons. I knew I had to learn how to project myself, he said, so I got a job teaching in different salons in the evenings. I used my tips to take a bus to the West End of London and go to the theatre. I'd catch the matinee and see great Shakespearean actors like Laurence Olivier and John Gielgud, and try to copy their voices. He went regularly to London's many art museums, and began to educate and inspire himself with the history of painting and architecture. I really think that was what set me on my course, he said. I was developing my own vision for hairdressing. The shapes in my head were always geometric. I've always been working toward a bone structure so as to define a woman rather than just to make her pretty pretty. I knew hairdressing could be different, but it took a lot of work and nine years to develop the system we use in our salons. In 1954, 
He and a partner opened a very small salon on the third floor of a building in London's fashionable Bond Street. Bond Street was magic to me, he said, because it meant the West End. It was where I couldn't get a job earlier. The West End meant I was going to make it. I was determined to change the way things were done or leave her dressing. For me, it wasn't a case of bouffants and arrangements. It was about structure and how you train the eye.